quantum mechanics is hard, at least mathematically speaking. In fact, most of the real world problems in quantum mechanics rarely have an exact solution. So many of these problems require us to use approximative methods to estimate how the system would behave. The fundamental idea behind perturbation theory is exactly this, to give an approximate solution to an otherwise unsolvable problem. In this video, we'll try to understand how perturbation theory works. Specifically, we will be covering time-independent and non-degenerate perturbation theory. Let's jump into it. So, before the intro, I mentioned a scary sounding term, time independent non degenerate perturbation theory. Let's start off by understanding what it means. The word time independent refers to the fact that this is a method for solving the time independent Schrodinger equation h psi equals e psi, where h is the Hamiltonian and e is the energy eigenvalue. The term non degenerate means that there is one and only one eigenstate psi corresponding to an eigenvalue E. In other words, if E1 is an energy eigenvalue with corresponding eigenstate psi1, then energy level E1 is said to be non-degenerate if psi1 is the only eigenstate for the eigenvalue E1. As a concrete example, the 1D harmonic oscillator is a non-degenerate system since there is only one possible wave function for each energy value. This is in contrast to a system of an electron in a hydrogen atom where two different states of an electron can have the same energy. For example, all the electrons in the p orbiter have the same energy, but this electron can be in three different states. So the electron in a hydrogen atom is an example of a degenerate system, which we'll take a look at in a future video. With that background, let's get into the actual method. Say that we want to solve the time independent Schrodinger equation for some system, but the problem is not exactly solvable. Luckily, perturbation theory gives us a way to find an approximate solution to such problems. Let's say that this h can be written as h0 plus lambda h1. Here, lambda is assumed to be a small constant, and we'll get back to what small exactly means. But the point is that the term lambda h1, which is also called the perturbation of the system, should be small. h0 corresponds to the exactly solvable part of our total Hamiltonian, while h1 is its unsolvable part. It is due to this h1 that the Schrodinger equation cannot be solved analytically. So we have essentially split our total Hamiltonian into a solvable part h0 and an unsolvable part h1, which is also multiplied by the scalar lambda. In effect, you can think of this lambda as a measure of how much the total system departs from an exactly solvable system. When I said earlier that the system is exactly solvable for H0, it meant that we can find the exact eigenvalues and eigenstates for the Schrodinger equation in H0. Note that we have introduced a superscript 0 into our notation here. It tells us that the eigenvalue or the eigenstate belongs to the exactly solvable part of our Hamiltonian H0. And since we are dealing with non-degenerate perturbation theory, we'll also add the constraint that all energy eigenvalues E and 0 must be non-degenerate. This equation will come in handy later on. So now let's create some space over here for the important equations 
which we'll need later. And let's also move this one over there. Using an assumption for perturbation theory, our Hamiltonian becomes H0 plus lambda H1 psi n, en psi n. Moving all the terms to one side, we get the following. And upon factoring out psi n, we obtain the following. Now here comes the crucial step. We'll expand the eigenstates and eigenvalues to our original problem using Taylor expansions in the variable lambda. So assume that the eigenvalues can be written as en is equal to en0, which is our known solution, plus a series of correction terms, en1, en2, and so on. Now these terms are just some numerical values which we don't know yet, and mathematically speaking, they are the coefficients of our Taylor expansion. And as in any Taylor series, these coefficients must be multiplied by increasing powers of lambda, like so. And now we'll do the same for the eigenstates as well and obtain the following. Now let's take this expression and insert these series expansions into it. So for En, We'll insert this expression over here. And let's move down psi n to get some space. For psi n, we'll insert this expression. Now, let's expand the equation. So here, we'll just multiply out the first few terms. It's only the first terms that will be important for our purposes. So we'll just denote the higher order terms with these three dots. And this process will go on for a while, so I'll just let the animation do its thing so that you can see the entire result. I'll remember that all of this equals to zero. So let's set that equal to zero. Now notice that this equation is valid for all values of lambda. And if you think about it a bit, you'll see that the only way this equation can be zero is if each term with a different power of lambda is equal to zero separately. So the sum of all the terms that are linear in lambda must be zero, all quadratic terms in lambda must be zero, and so on. Now let's look at the terms that are linear in lambda. Upon isolating the terms with a factor of lambda, we get the following equation. Uh, that must be equal to zero as discussed. We'll use this equation later, so let's move it over here. Now we'll multiply this with bra n zero from left and obtain the following. Let's try to simplify this. The first term is equal to zero. Can you see why? It's a good exercise to try and figure it out for yourself. So pause the video here and see if you can understand why this must be the case. So were you able to figure it out? If not, don't worry. We'll take a closer look at it now. Notice that due to the properties of bras and cats, we can switch their positions as long as we take the adjoint of the operator and conjugate the result. But note that en0 must be a real constant since it is an eigenvalue and the postulates of quantum mechanics say that these eigenvalues are actually what we are measuring in the real world and they must therefore be real value. Since H0 is a self-adjoint operator and EN0 is real valued, we have that this entire operator H0 minus EN0 is self-adjoint. So we can just remove the dagger. Now, if we take this equation and move all the terms to one side 
and factor out n0, we see that we have exactly what's here on the right side, and that is equal to 0. So we have bra n1 into 0, which is 0. Therefore, the first term must be 0. Therefore, this equation reduces to just the second term like so. Using the linearity of inner products, we can split it up like this. E n1 is just a constant, so we can pull it out. And the inner product of a normalized eigenstate with itself is just 1. Moving over the energy term to the other side, we obtain the following. Now if we rearrange, we see that we have arrived at our final result. This result is sometimes also written as lambda E1 equals N0, lambda H1, N0. Now let's understand what we have found here. If we truncate the Taylor expansion for our energy eigenvalue En up to the first order terms, we can then write it as En0 plus lambda En1. Now, what we have just found is an expression for the second term, lambda En1. Inserting the expression for lambda En1 here, we get an approximation for the eigenvalue of our original problem. With that out of the way, let's take a look at how we can find the eigenstates. Remember that now we are trying to find an expression for the get n1. Now we'll take this equation and multiply it by the bra m0 from the left, where m0 is different from n0, and obtain an equation like this. And we'll simplify the second term. In order to do that, we'll use the linearity property to split this term like so. Since en1 is just a constant, we have pulled it out. And due to the fact that energy eigenstates are orthogonal and because we have assumed m0 to be different from n0, the inner product of m0 and n0 will just be 0. So this last term will just vanish. Now, we'll try to simplify the first term. We'll start off by switching the pros and gets and once again, remember that we have to take the complex conjugate if we do that. And as before, we'll drop the dagger for the operator since we concluded that it was self-adjoint. Now, just as we did for the second term, we'll split up this operator into two terms. Let's try to simplify the first term. Specifically, we'll consider this part. How can we simplify this? Remember that H0 was the Hamiltonian for our exactly solvable system, and we had that H0N0 is equal to EN0N0. Now, if we just rename the get N0 to M0, we get this expression. And note the renaming of the eigenvalue subscript as well. So, H0M0 is nothing but EM0M0. So we can just put that into our expression and pulling out the constants from the first two terms. We can then factor out the brackets like so. And let's also flip and conjugate the first get. And let's move everything to the same line. Now we'll try to isolate the bracket m0 n1 in the first term. We'll start by moving this term over and divide by em minus en and we'll absorb the negative sign into the denominator and obtain the following. Remember, we wanted an expression for the get n1 but what we have here is an expression for the inner product between m0 and n1. So somehow we need to isolate n1. For that, we'll use a well-known trick in quantum mechanics and that is the completeness relation. If you're unfamiliar with the completeness relation, check out the short video I did on the topic. It is a real nifty trick and absolutely worth knowing. Anyways, the completeness relation 
says that n1 can be written as a sum over m0 of ket m0 times the inner product of m0 n1. And we already know what the inner product between m0 and n1 is. So inserting this into our completeness relation, we get an expression for the get n1. And that is exactly what we were after. To summarize, we talked about how the time-independent Schrodinger equation is often unsolvable. Therefore, we need a way to approximate its eigenstates and eigenvalues. That's where perturbation theory comes in. It is useful when the Hamiltonian can be split into an exactly solvable part H0 and an unsolvable part H1. And here, lambda is assumed to be a small constant. Let's also remind ourselves that here, we are only looking at non-degenerate perturbation theory. So all the energy eigenvalues for the unperturbed Hamiltonian H0 are non-degenerate. After that, we found an approximation for the energy eigenstate by using the Taylor expansion in lambda up to the first order. And after some calculation, we arrived at an expression for EM1. And inserting it, we obtained the approximation for the eigenvalues. Then, we did something quite similar for the eigenstates. We used the Taylor expansion up to first order then derived an expression for n1. Inserting it here gives us the final approximation for the eigenstate. Before we end this video, there are a few technical points I would like to make. First of all, we have assumed lambda to be small, but how small does lambda really need to be? The straight answer is that lambda has to be small enough for this condition to hold. To understand this, let's see what happens if this condition does indeed hold. So if this bracket with m0 lambda h1 n0 is indeed much smaller than the difference in energy values of state n and m, then this fraction would be small. In turn, this entire term, which corresponds to the first order correction, would be small. And this is exactly what we want. We want the higher order correction terms to be smaller and smaller, so that we can safely truncate our approximation at some power of lambda. So, in a sense, this condition for smallness of lambda comes from the fact that higher order correction terms must be smaller and smaller. Another point is that for some applications, it turns out that this term, it can be zero. So in that case, first order approximations do not suffice and we need to find the second order approximation for the energy eigenvalue. We'll take a detailed look at this scenario in an upcoming video about the Stark effect. Lastly, I would like to mention that perturbation theory is just one of the tools used in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics itself is actually a vast field covering a wide range of fascinating topics. If you wish to understand the quantum theory in depth, consider subscribing to World of Quantum where we demystify quantum physics a video at a time.